thank you to Roberta for the introduction and getting us oriented with this webinar technology. So thanks to everyone who is joining us today, um, also to those who are listening afterwards after the webinar has been posted online. For those of you who are joining live, I hope you'll post some questions and stay around afterward for some discussion. This webinar is a companion to a recent report that was released through the National Collaborating Centre for Aboriginal Health the introduction to the health of two-spirit people. And today I'm going to talk about some of the same themes in the report, but I'll also be skimming over some sections in order to provide a more thorough introduction, especially to gender, sex, and sexuality, which was not covered, kind of the kind of intro to that to terminology, especially in the report, and also to introduce some ways that you can continue your learning beyond the webinar. So if you're interested, I encourage you to read the report, especially some of the kind of health areas that I touch on today. There's much more in-depth discussion of each of those areas and the research behind it in the report. So I'm approaching this webinar today very much as an introductory discussion of issues related to Two-Spirit Health. So this means I'm assuming that most of you are new to talking about Two-Spirit issues, and I'll be taking some time to get comfortable with the diversity of terminology I'm talking about gender, sex, and sexuality before we move ahead into the, into the topic. So today we'll be spending some time developing an understanding of who Two-Spirit people are, as well as discussing the impact of colonization on Indigenous gender and sexuality, and the implications of colonization on the well-being of Two-Spirit people. We'll then spend some time talking about themes in the literature that is available on Two-Spirit health, and then move to a more strength-based approach to Two-Spirit health kind of within a more holistic framework, ending with some discussions or some suggestions for how you can con continue to foster the health of Two-Spirit people in your own community after the webinar. So before we go ahead, um, Roberta did introduce me, but I wanted to also introduce myself. In, my, in our uh, tradition, it, you're supposed to uh, introduce yourself before you speak. So, I'm speaking to you today from the territories of the Honkaminam speaking Musqueam people in what's now known as Vancouver. And as Roberta said, I'm Sarah Hunt. My name in Kwakwala is Tlalihi Laogwa, or someone who goes around inviting people. And I am a Kwagil ancestry on my dad's side and Ukrainian and English ancestry on my mom's side. The Kwagil are part of the Kwakwakiwak Nation from Sahis, which is near Fort Rupert, on the northern part of what's now called Vancouver Island. And I was born in um, the Kongan territories in Victoria, BC, and spent much of my life living on the Songhees Reserve. My formal education, as Roberta said, includes a PhD from Simon Fraser University, but I consider my education to be more fully formed within the community and family relationships with whom I've come to understand colonization and decolonization, Indigenous issues over my lifetime. So my own work around these issues really began as a teenager uh, when I started to become concerned about intergenerational violence in my own community, and that led to really long-term work that I'm still doing today on issues of violence in both institutional and community settings. And since 2000, I've worked as a community-based researcher and educator, which included various provincial and federal government ministries, as well as for Indigenous communities and organizations around, mostly around BC. I'm really honored to have collaborated with Indigenous organizations and communities over the years on issues of health, safety, healing, cultural revitalization, and justice. And in particular, I'm really honored to have been able to work with youth, Indigenous youth, some of which I will be touching on today, some more recent work around Indigenous youth issues. And since 2015, as Roberta said, I've worked here at UBC as an assistant professor, and I teach classes on Indigenous research methodologies. Indigenous geography, law and justice, and gender and sexuality. So this is kind of an introduction to who I am professionally. But equally important, I think I want to introduce myself as well through my own coming in story or ident into my identity as a two-spirit person. I want to share a little bit of this to emphasize that I speak from my own experience and my own kind of social location and understanding of this term of what it is to be two-spirit. As you'll see as we go along, there is no singular definition for what it means to be two-spirit. And so I want to 
I'll be encouraging everybody to really think about the breadth and scope and diversity of two-spirit experience. And you may have heard of the term coming out as a way to talk about gay or queer people's process of opening up to others about their sexual or gender identity. This can be a painful process as it coming out risks rejection, discrimination, or anger, both from professionals you come out to, like doctors, social workers, or teachers, as well as your close friends and family members. And this idea of coming out um, has been, I think, really beautifully reframed by a Pasquayat Cree scholar, Alex Wilson, who's a professor at the University of Saskatchewan. And Alex talks, um, as you see on, in this quote on the screen, about the process Indigenous people go through coming in. And this is not, she says, a declaration or announcement like coming out can be or is imagined. Rather, it's an affirmation of identity. So an Indigenous person comes into their understanding of their relationship, place, and value in their own community, their own family, culture, and history. And this coming in often includes shedding layers of shame and silence taught by colonization. Coming in can also include searching for and rediscovering lost cultural knowledge about gender and sexual diversity within our own cultures and communities. So for myself, my own sort of coming in to myself began when I was about 19, um, when I had my first girlfriend in university. And with this relationship, I began to accept that I had been attracted to women for a long time, but I had always sort of felt ashamed about this. In my own family and community, there were and are a visible presence of two-spirit people. So I grew up with gay relatives, queer aunties, transgender neighbors, but it was rarely talked about or named. It was just sort of normalized. I grew up thinking that difference was a strength, but I didn't have the words to talk about the gender and sexual diversity around me. This wasn't something that was taught in school and sex ed or other, in other ways when we talked about relationships and just was sort of taken for granted in the communities that I grew up in. So while some people, Indigenous people, grow up steeped in cultural teachings about two-spirit traditions and cultural roles, this was not the case for me. So for many years, I just resisted labels around my own sexuality. I felt most comfortable using the term queer because it can hold a range of, of kind of expressions of sexuality. And really thought about two-spirit, as I will talk about, two-spirit is understood in a diversity of ways, but including around gender fluidity or gender identity. And so I didn't really see this term applying to me because my identity was more around, around sexuality. But I did start to embrace the term two-spirit more recently. For one, when I started to look more at kind of cultural teachings in my own community around transformation figures um, as a Kulpakiwak person, understanding my own name. Uh, and what that means. But I also started to use it because uh, Indigenous young people started really identifying me with the term, claiming me as part of a two-spirit community. And it was at this point that I realized it was important to publicly name and celebrate my identity, not only in my family and community, but also out outwardly in my professional work as a way of kind of further shedding the shame Indigenous people have been taught about our bodies, our sexualities, and gender identities. So now I sometimes identify with two-spirit, other times I, I use other terms. And as I'll talk about today, there are still many gaps in knowledge about Indigenous understandings of gender and sexuality because of the impact of colonization on our lives, including our languages and cultural practices. So for me, I think the thing I want to emphasize is that this is a kind of fluid or shifting process, and I'm sure for myself there will be other terms I might use in the future to talk about my identity. So I'm, I'm telling you this as a way into this discussion, both to kind of position myself and say that I speak only for myself, that my own analysis is informed by my experience, but also, of course, my scholarly perspective, but also to encourage you, as I will at the end, to think about your own position, your own motivation, your biases, your beliefs, and how these impact your approach to this topic. So then what does two-spirit mean? Um, so there's an important historic lineage to the term two-spirit, and there's also a diversity of ways you might hear the term being used by two-spirit people in your community today, and I want to talk a bit about both aspects of the term. So prior to colonization, Indigenous gender roles and identities were embedded in cultural and social practices and were as diverse as Indigenous cultures themselves. 
So just as Indigenous nations have our own languages and ceremonial practices, our own political orders, so too does each Indigenous nation have its own teachings around gender and sexuality. Some linguistic researchers today have said that approximately two-thirds of the 200 or so Indigenous languages spoken in North America had terms, or still have, some still have those terms, to describe individuals who are neither men nor women. So this talks specifically about kind of gender fluidity or gender concepts of gender. When I was growing up, I knew, for example, I had a neighbor who, who told me that in his language there were six distinct genders. So lots of variation amongst our communities. Broadly speaking, Indigenous views on sexuality accounted for diverse sexual practices and identities. Within many Indigenous teachings, having sexual relationships with someone of the same sex or gender was not viewed as deviant. Gender roles and sexual identities were based on multiple social factors and reflected Indigenous cultural, political, and spiritual worldviews, which were and are culturally specific. While it's important not to romanticize Indigenous peoples as being uniformly accepting of gender and sexual fluidity, research and oral histories reflect widespread respect and honour for two-spirit people. Within many Indigenous cultures, the roles of individuals we now call two-spirit carried unique responsibilities that were vital to the nation's collective well-being and survival. And this includes teachers as knowledge keepers, as herbalists, healers, childminders, spiritual leaders, interpreters, mediators, and artists. Taking up important roles in their communities, two-spirit people contributed alongside other members of the community in the maintenance of the community's spiritual and physical well-being. And as I'll talk about, colonization has greatly interrupted these practices along with other Indigenous ways of life. Importantly, though, Indigenous gender and sexual diversity has continued despite colonial efforts to impose Western norms. Anthropologists were fascinated with Indigenous people, well, in general, we know, but including Indigenous people who did not fit into typical Western male-female roles. And they wrote for many years about them using the term berdash. Anthropologists held these individuals in high esteem, but they also romanticized, othered, or pathologized them, not understanding their role in cultural terms, in, in terms that made sense within Indigenous communities themselves. In rejecting this framework, Indigenous people came together in the early 1990s to choose a new term that would better reflect the fullness and diversity of their identities, and that was where the term two-spirit came into popular usage. So, in 1994, it was chosen at an annual Native American Gay and Lesbian Gathering in Winnipeg as a term that refers to the diversity of Indigenous, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer identities, as well as culturally specific non-binary gender identities and cultural roles. So two-spirit is a term that encompasses a huge range of gender and sexual identities of Indigenous peoples across North America. Some people use the term to refer specifically to the individuals who embody both male and female or masculine and feminine kind of spirits. In this usage, two-spirit is about both the important cultural roles I mentioned earlier and a gender role or identity that can't be contained in the gender binary or these categories of men and women. Two-spirit is also used by Indigenous people who identify as lesbian, gay, bisexual, queer, pansexual, asexual, and this way, two-spirit is about sexuality rather than being about gender. Importantly, some queer Indigenous people don't identify with the term two-spirit at all, preferring to, to call themselves gay or lesbian or bi, and to use those terms instead. And there's also a great revitalization now of Indigenous words for gender roles and sexual identities connected to broader revitalization of Indigenous languages. So many of these words are difficult to translate into English because they describe ways of being that are at once about someone's role in a spiritual and cultural system, as well as expressive of gender identity and or sexuality. And some Indigenous people are using these identity terms rather than two-spirit um, in some contexts. So two-spirit then has many diverse meanings. It's used in, in different ways by people of different ages, cultural backgrounds, geographic locations, and identities. So when we talk about two-spirit health, we are not talking about one population, but many. And I think that comes out when we, when we look at what the literature says. We're talking about gender, sexuality, and indigeneity in a diversity of ways. 
And so here on the screen, I have kind of, as you can see that Two-Spirit includes, some people say, it, use it to mean indigenous plus gay, lesbian, bisexual. Some people use it to talk about being indigenous and trans. Some people talk about, use it to talk about specific uh, gender identities that are, that are rooted in their cultures. And then it's also used to talk about a cultural role. So beyond kind of the English language, something that can't really be translated into English. So it's used in all of these ways. So for some of you, some of those terms might be new. And so I wanted to spend just a bit of time talking about these different, what is gender, what is sex, sex what is sexuality? Because I do think that it's important to be comfortable with these different terms and to know what it is that we're talking about. And this is a graphic from the Nunavut Department of Health website. They have a, a website called I Respect Myself. And this is kind of an, an adaptation of um, another graphic that is called the genderbred uh, person, like gingerbread, but genderbred, but kind of stylized in um, an Inuit, uh, to have an Inuit person at the middle, which I, I really like. I think this will give us some, some helpful language to use. At the same time, I think it doesn't fully, it's missing a little bit when we talk about two-spirit people. So first of all, we can see words to talk about gender identity and gender expression. Gender expression, as you see, is kind of the outward appearance, how people present themselves to the world. And right-hand side, they have it kind of along a continuum. I've also seen it represented in a circle to talk about kind of two halves in balance, talk about feminine and masculine are aspects of gender expression. Some people might be have, be, feel they're connected to both or be sort of at different places on the, on the spectrum. Gender identity there you can see is located here in the brain. So how people identify, how they see themselves. And that may or may not match up with how you perceive them on the outside. So someone might have a gender identity. Again, it's represented here along the spectrum of a man or woman, and that these may or may not kind of link up in the way that, that you expect. <laughs> so within uh, the Western sort of gender binary, terms for gender are usually thought to include men and boy, men and boys, women and girls. But in fact, gender terms are extremely diverse, and that includes gender queer, gender fluid, transgender, gender creative, and trans, as well as two-spirit. A trans literally means a cross. So trans or transgender means someone who presents, lives, or identifies as a gender other than the one they were assigned at birth or moving across the spectrum. And trans is often used also as an umbrella term to include many non-binary identities. As a person's gender identity shifts, they might identify with different pronouns. So pronouns include typically he or she, but also they, or Z is another one that's used, and a range of other creative words. And the important point I want to emphasize here is that our assumptions based on a person's perceived gender expression, as I said, may or may not match up with their gender identity and the terms that they use that they want to be called. I think the best way we can support people, as we'll talk about later, is by meeting people where they're at and not making assumptions based on someone's outside appearance about what their gender identity might be also accepting that this may change over time. There's also a great number of words in Indigenous languages to talk about gender diversity, as I said before. And while some of these terms have been lost through colonization, some nations are recovering these words or creating new words to talk about a diversity of genders. So sex then refers to a person's physical characteristics, chromosomes, hormones. In Western culture, these are usually used to determine if a person's male or female within the gender binary. But a person, sex can also be intersex, which is having both male and female reproductive organs or physical characteristics that don't fit neatly into male-female categories, or transsexual, so a term that means somebody who has begun hormone treatment, surgery, or other physical transition to alter the physical sex characteristics that they were born with. Within Western culture, the sex a person is ascribed at birth is generally assumed to kind of match up with an appropriate, what's deemed to be an appropriate gender designation. So people who are, whose sex is male are thought to be gendered as boys and females as girls. And this is what the, we understand as the gender binary. Broadly speaking, sexuality is the expression of an individual as a sexual being, including their, their sexual identity and sexual attractions, which they have on the bottom here. Here they have kind of this um, symbolized through the heart, so romantic attraction, 
again, that can be along the spectrum or people might be asexual and not be romantically attracted to anybody and also sexual attraction. So they've got these separated out because someone may be romantically involved with someone of a certain gender, but be sexually attracted to a range of people along the spectrum. So these are both related to sexuality. Again, two-spirit is a term that spans these Western categories. And, you know, sexuality, people talk about being heterosexual, straight, gay, lesbian, queer, bisexual. This also includes two-spirit. So looking at the center of this graphic, we see an Indigenous body. And I think this is really important to, to emphasize because in this graphic and the way that it's used in a lot of Western contexts, gender identity, biological sex, and romantic attractions or sexuality are imagined as being separate. But in two-spirit concepts and in a lot of Indigenous concepts, they are really interconnected. And so for some people, you know, what's missing in this graphic is spirit or spirituality. That two-spirit is often about a cultural role, about gender identity, about many things that really connect, are connected through, I think, the body, which is at the center of this graphic. So for me, I would, I would infuse this with a little bit of kind of Indigenous worldview by seeing these not as separated out, but as very much interconnected and also infused with, potentially for some people, connected to a spiritual role. So this is useful in giving us some language, but it doesn't fully, I don't think, capture, we need to do a little bit of alteration to fully capture Indigenous concepts of gender and sexuality. So now that we have some language to talk about the diversity of two-spirit identities, cultural roles, and lived experience, I want to talk about the way colonization has impacted two-spirit people. Looking beyond the social determinants of Indigenous health, it's important to recognize that all of the health determinants in Indigenous people's lives, whether geographic, environmental, economic, or political, are situated in relation to colonization as the overarching determinant. Colonization interrupted the culturally specific roles and responsibilities of two-spirit people in innumerable ways. As with other Indigenous people and communities more broadly, displacement and dispossession, environmental degradation, the disruption of land-based practices, cultural and ceremonial practices, disruption of our languages have all impacted the health of two-spirit people. As members of Indigenous communities, Two-spirit people have faced the same social determinants resulting from colonization as their other relatives, and they've worked alongside their relations to resist and work to transform colonial relations both systemically and interpersonally. But colonization had and has specific impacts on two-spirit people due to the way in which norms around gender and sexuality work to devalue and in some cases suppress or erase completely two-spirit ways of being. Two of the primary ways Indigenous beliefs around gender and sexuality were interrupted was through the Indian Act and the residential school system. Colonial efforts to assimilate Indigenous people involved the imposition of categories of race, gender, and sexuality, which continue to be seen as the norm today and really embedded in the languages, the language that we use to talk about these things. Through the Indian Act, along with Christian teachings about morality and other assimilative processes, Indigenous people were forced to follow a hetero-patriarchal model of marriage in order to gain rights and status. The imposition of gendered power relations among men and women were at the core of these efforts. And this is clearly seen in the Indian Act designation of status and rights through heterosexual marriage, which is well known to be biased against Indigenous women, but is often not acknowledged as legislating status both through the gender binary and heterosexuality. Through the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in recent years, we've heard a great deal about the racism and all sorts of kinds of violence children experienced in the residential school system. Importantly, the schools also imposed and enforced strict divisions between gender expectations for girls and boys, such as through imposing European dress and hairstyles, different jobs or chores for girls and boys, and physically separating boys and girls in different dorms. There was no way for kids who didn't fit into the boy-girl boxes to exist in these spaces. They were simply made to conform to this gender binary. Of course, the sexual abuse of kids in residential schools, as long as teaching children to be ashamed of their bodies and their sexualities, have had a lasting impact on two-spirit people, including their health on two-spirit health today. The legacy of these colonial processes lives on, and two-spirit people continue to resist them 
Rather than being respected as they once were, some two-spirit people face targeted violence in their communities, as I'm going to be talking about. The two-spirit people struggle to have their lives recognized in dominant policy frameworks, both within Indigenous and non-Indigenous contexts, as their lives are often not fully accounted for in either current LGBTQ or gay, lesbian, bisexual, queer, trans literature in the way that that's framed, or in Indigenous either health frameworks and also gender frameworks. And one important colonial legacy that I want to emphasize here, coming from sort of linking to the Indian Act and residential school system and the ways of thinking about gender and sexuality through that, is heteronormativity. This is a useful word for us all to know, I think. So heteronormativity is the belief that people fall into distinct and complementary genders, men and women, and that heterosexuality is the norm. This belief system is culturally biased in favor of opposite sex relationships. And discourses of heteronormativity have been embedded in social institutions such as the family, the state, and education, resulting in the marginalization of LGBTQ and two-spirit lives. So in terms of healthcare, examples of heteronormativity include, for example, assuming all women are straight. So the kind of questions that doctors and health providers ask about women, I'll say myself, about our husbands and boyfriends sort of come, having, forcing you to come out all the time to doctors and other health professionals. Another example of heteronormativity is the assumption all males are sexually active with females and vice versa. This is really prevalent in sex ed and schools and youth centers, often in conversations parents have about sex or relationships with their kids. And we even see this early on with, with children, people making jokes about girl kids having crushes on boys and that kind of thing. And this teaches kids that being that having other kinds of attractions isn't normal or is not okay. Heteronormativity is also seen in the lack of representation of queer relationships and queer bodies and health pamphlets, ads, or posters we see in health settings. And it's also seen in just gendered language that we use. So we often talk about, you know, brothers and sisters, different ways of thinking about men and women that really shuts out the possibility that there are other kinds of people in the space. While heteronormativity is a structural assumption that everyone is or should be heterosexual and should fit within the gender binary, more explicit forms of discrimination experienced by two-spirit people include homophobia and transphobia. So transphobia is a fear, discrimination, or hatred of transsexual, transgender, or genderqueer people based on the expression of their gender identity. And these attitudes emerge in societal norms which uphold this kind of gender binary, the man-woman binary, which views deviations from these norms as unacceptable. And homophobia is discrimination against or hatred of people who are LGBTQ, S. Homophobia is interpersonal, so in the form of homophobic slurs or violence, and it's also systemic. These forms of discrimination combined with racism create great barriers for two-spirit people in accessing health care. So I'm going to discuss in more detail, you'll see this theme of thinking about the interconnections between racism, homophobia, transphobia, and heteronormativity in terms of shaping in two-spirit health. And this is discussed in more detail in the report that these are really key health determinants for two-spirit people. These forms of discrimination shape other social determinants of health, such as poverty, education, and housing. So for example, research has shown that two-spirit people experience much higher rates of poverty Research has also indicated that two-spirit people experience higher dropout rates than other Indigenous people in schools due to discrimination they face about their sexual or gender identity combined with their indigeneity. Gender non-conforming kids of all cultural groups have been shown to face increased rates of violence and bullying in Canadian schools, which is something I will talk about. These intersecting forms of discrimination have an impact then on the well-being of two-spirit people across diverse settings. And as you'll, you can read in more detail in the report, research conducted with two-spirit people in Canadian cities has found that many two-spirit people can't fully be themselves or can't access adequate health services in smaller communities. So the city is seen by some two-spirit people as a place to find a more accepting queer community, which strengthens the affirmation of their gender and sexual identity. But in moving to the city, two-spirit people often leave behind strong cultural and social support systems and face a different set of barriers. And these challenges include finding housing and employment, dealing with racism and exploitation, and experiencing barriers in accessing services. 
the structure, design, and delivery of healthcare has been found to be deeply impacted by homophobia, transphobia, and heteronormativity, as well as racism, combining to create numerous barriers then for two-spirit people as they try to access healthcare. And this systemic marginalization is important to understand as we look to the available literature on two-spirit health. Because when we look at health literature more broadly, literature about Indigenous health, heteronormativity in health research, as in healthcare, often erases or overlooks two-spirit people altogether. That's why on the screen I say, what does the literature say about two-spirit people? Not much. The systemic suppression of sexual and gender diversity and the rupturing of two-spirit roles in Indigenous cultures have resulted in two-spirit people's lives often being made invisible in many aspects of our lives, but including in Indigenous health. This invisibility is furthered in the lack of statistical information gathered on two-spirit people's lives due to the categorical omission of transgender, transsexual, and other gender nonconforming two-spirit people. Legal rights that are delineated through male and female categories force two-spirit people to choose between these gender categories and to fit their lives within gay-straight dichotomies used in law, public policy, and health research, if any diversion from heterosexuality is acknowledged at all. This forced adherence to colonial categories of gender and sexuality is itself really a structural erasure of two-spirit people's lives from public discourse. Two-spirit people are largely unaccounted for in both LGBTQ health paradigms and in Indigenous health paradigms. Broadly speaking, academic research on Canadian health and healthcare access excludes queer people, while the growing body of research on queer health has little reference to two-spirit people. Two-spirit, trans, and genderqueer people often remain invisible within the gender-based analyses used by national and provincial organizations that represent Indigenous people across Canada. So, for example, there's a report that my colleague Cindy Holmes and I recently wrote about Indigenous family violence literature. This is for the National Collaborating Center. We did a webinar about it last, last year, I think, and the report will be coming out soon. And we found that of uh, 36 sources on Indigenous family violence in Canada over the last 15 years, only four even acknowledged the existence of LGBTQ and two-spirit people. And this is concerning because this is about families, relationships, and so very much, you know, a heteronormative model being used. The research that has been conducted on two-spirit health often focuses on a limited number of issues, which can make it appear as though these are the only health concerns of this population, while leaving two-spirit people invisible in broader health interventions, such as around nutrition, reproductive health, and access to clean water. This, in turn, has an impact on the types of policies that are created, funding priorities, and the design and delivery of health programs. So I'm now going to talk a bit about and I won't go into too much detail again because it is in the report, about some of the trends I found in literature that is focused on two-spirit health, sort of considering the broader erasure within Indigenous health research. So the first theme that I found is violence. It's worth repeating that rates of violence experienced by two-spirit people are difficult to gauge because of a lack of statistical information. While national data is collected on violence against Indigenous men and women, the same is not captured for trans people or LGBTQ people. And even if statistics were gathered, we know that underreporting to police would be likely because of the mistrust in police for a variety of reasons. But we do know that two-spirit people experience targeted violence because of this combination of racism, homophobia, transphobia, and sexism, depending on their individual identity. Research has found that two-spirit women are more likely to be sexually and physically assaulted than heterosexual Indigenous women and white queer women. The combination of risk factors for two-spirit women has been described by some as a triple jeopardy, targeted due to sexism, homophobia, racism, and for trans women, also transphobia. Transgender and gender nonconforming Indigenous people face heightened levels of violence, including everyday violence encountered while accessing gender-segregated spaces like public washrooms, and in public spaces, walking down the street or taking the bus. Two-spirit people report facing discriminatory treatment by individuals in positions of power, and of particular concern is homophobic violence within agencies to which two-spirit people turn for support, including verbal abuse, lateral violence, uh, and other kinds of violence, which compound the violence that happens on the street and in our communities. 
And these findings indicate the need for a deeper integration of Two-Spirit people's lived experience in local and national strategies to address violence. So, for example, national strategies to talk about violence against Indigenous women sometimes include trans women, sometimes don't. But even when they do, it's often the specificity of violence faced by trans women is not really talked about. For example, one of the women on the original list of missing women from the downtown east side was an Indigenous trans woman, something that's really in, made invisible in the way that, those, that that issue is talked about nationally. So Two-Spirit people's ability to seek support after a violent incident is further impacted by the lack of culturally relevant and gender-inclusive services that don't always meet their specific needs. And we know that violence and discrimination, of course, have ripple effects impacting rates of self-harm, suicidality, mental illness, and substance use. And so that's leading into the second theme of mental health and substance use, which there has been some research on in terms of Two-Spirit health. Research in both Canada and the U.S. indicates that Two-Spirit people are more likely to experience mental health issues such as depression and anxiety, as well as using substances such as drugs and alcohol as coping mechanisms. Depression and anxiety experienced by Two-Spirit people are related, again, to the systemic discrimination we've been talking about, as well as the intergenerational trauma, which is shared by many Indigenous people. So mental health and substance use are key health concerns for Two-Spirit people. Attendance at boarding school or residential school has been found to impact mental health and substance use among Two-Spirit people or sort of intergenerational impacts of that in their families. It's important to think about this in relation to the recent Truth and Reconciliation Commission, its report and calls to action, which don't mention Two-Spirit people at all. While one call to action focuses on, on Indigenous women, the restoration of respect for Two-Spirit people is not talked about. And I think this is really important to note uh, this omission because of the historic role of residential schools in really erasing Two-Spirit gender roles. Again, a lack of access to culturally appropriate and non-heteronormative services for Two-Spirit people may further impact their mental health status. So Two-Spirit people often face barriers to accessing mental health, addiction and harm reduction services through discrimination from health practitioners. They may also be stigmatized or pathologized as homosexuality and transsexuality used to be classified as mental health disorders in Canada. And that really speaks to some of the lingering stigma and social stigma around this. Although changes in mental health diagnosis have shifted to be more accepting of the range of LGBTQ identities, there are a few mental health, harm reduction, and substance use treatment facilities that fully account for Two-Spirit people's cultural, gender, and sexual identities. And importantly, some of those facilities are gender segregated across the two genders and don't necessarily account for Two-Spirit people. So suicide is obviously another related theme within the available literature on Two-Spirit health. Uh, health concerns shared among Indigenous communities more broadly. We know that Indigenous people experience higher rates of suicide than non-Indigenous people, but also that queer people, both youth and adults, also experience higher rates risk of suicide. Research has found that homophobia, isolation, and rejection increase the risk of suicide for Two-Spirit people. So, for example, Indigenous trans people in one study indicated that their distress was caused by the experience of being transgender in a transphobic society rather than being transgender itself. So I think this is really important um, kind of reframing. Some researchers and community advocates think that youth suicide can be decreased through stronger cultural connectedness, historical continuity and identity, as well as access to cultural practices, land-based learning, and Indigenous languages. And I wanted to mention someone who I see as a really great leader in talking about mental health and suicide, and that is a Two-Spirit trans leader, Jack Saddleback, who's Cree from the Samson Cree Nation in Alberta, and is also part of the Mental Health Commission of Canada. Jack has a number of videos available online in which he talks about coming to terms with his identity as a trans man and as a Two-Spirit person. And he emphasizes that cultural teachings and the love and support from his family helped to combat the depression he experienced as a young person. Speaking out about mental illness and suicide, as well as speaking about the pride he has in his culture and two-spirit identity, Jack is working to remove the stigma around mental illness, as well as the stigma around trans and two-spirit issues. So the fourth theme is HIV AIDS. And I have here a photo of Sandy Lambert, who allowed me to use this with his permission. <laughs> 
because I want to hold up the really important work that Sandy and others do and, and have done for many decades in HIV AIDS education, research, and direct community support. And Sandy has worked for years within Canadian HIV AIDS organizations, serving on boards as a staff member, a public speaker, and a researcher. And there's much more that can be said about this theme, but I'll just mention a few things. So we know that Indigenous people's HIV infection rate is about three and a half times higher than for non-Indigenous people. Indigenous youth remain the most highly impacted. For example, Indigenous youth in 2009 represented 46% of HIV positive youth in Canada. Huge number. Due to the lack of acknowledgement of gender and sexual diversity in na national health statistics, again, no data is available on rates of HIV AIDS specifically for two-spirit people. But we know that HIV AIDS has been a key health concern for many years among two-spirit people. And this is, again, abundantly clear through the decades of activism and leadership of two-spirit people in addressing this health issue. So in the 1980s, HIV AIDS emerged as an important catalyst for two-spirit community organizing. Responding to HIV in Native communities was an important part of the emergence of Two-Spirit identity in North America. As um, taking up leadership roles within HIV-AIDS activism, Two-Spirit people began to define their individual and community health, wellness, and identities, and really began to form community. Two-Spirit people continue to be at the front and center in efforts to create culturally relevant and age-appropriate sexual health programming to be delivered in ways that resonate on a personal level for Indigenous people in general and Two-Spirit people in particular. And Sandy and I did a presentation last year on Two-Spirit methodology, something that, that we'll be publishing soonish along with Alex Wilson um, with the Canadian Aboriginal AIDS Network. And Sandy really generously shared some of the changes he's seen over the years of doing this work and was really pleased to say that Two-Spirit people now have more of a voice in health organizations because of the decades of work that have been done in this area and that he feels his views as a Two-Spirit person are more respected than they were in the past. And this, he said, was evident in invitations to lead cultural ceremonies at the beginning of gatherings or meetings, as well as increased representation on boards and staff of Indigenous health organizations. So the leadership of Two-Spirit people in shaping HIV-AIDS education and health programming has already had an impact, and research suggests that HIV awareness campaigns that explicitly target or recognize Two-Spirit people have resulted in much higher rates of HIV testing among Two-Spirit people than among non-Indigenous LGBTQ people. And I think then when we think of that really alarmingly high rate of HIV among Indigenous youth, that definitely speaks to the you know, high rates of HIV infection, but it also speaks potentially to the fact that Indigenous youth are getting tested more often because of all of the education that's gone on in their community. So it's important to keep that in mind, I think. So I now just want to talk a bit about specific research that has been done on youth health. And again, this is talked about in more depth in the report. But, you know, two of the areas that has really been looked at in terms of youth health is bullying, homophobia, and racism, as well as street involvement, homelessness, and exploitation. I'll just, just briefly mention a few things. So, again, there's a lack of specific research on two-spirit youth experiences, but we can kind of piece together research that's looked at homophobia, racism, and transphobia that youth experience in Canadian schools. In a 2011 study, nearly 70% of LGBTQ youth in Canada said they felt unsafe at school. And we can extrapolate that this lack of safety at school will only compound high dropout rates that Indigenous youth continue to face. Although some schools do make efforts to show solidarity with queer students in a variety of ways, national research says that about half of queer students hear homophobic comments every day at school, including homophobic comments from teachers. And this discrimination impacts trans and gender non-conforming students in ways that are important to understand as these students face higher rates of harassment as well as physical assault and sexual harassment. Indigenous youth are also targeted for physical assault because of racism, compounding the marginalization of two-spirit students who are not only being targeted because of homophobia or transphobia, but also potentially because of racism. So clearly the targeted violence and discrimination two-spirit youth experience continues to be a key health concern 
and one that student schools, parents, and also allied youth must work together to address. So these are not simply individual health issues, but societal issues that emerge within this current context of colonization. And secondly, research reflects the specific health needs of two-spirit youth who are street involved. Lesbian, gay, and bisexual youth have been shown to be highly overrepresented among Indigenous street involved and homeless youth. The street involved two-spirit youth have been found to be significantly more likely to report sexual exploitation than street involved Indigenous youth who are straight. Again, stigma and discrimination contribute to their vulnerability. Homophobia and transphobia can cause young people to become isolated or rejected by family or friends, increasing their vulnerability. And it's also worth noting that sex education and sexual health services for street-involved youth often follow a heteronormative model that doesn't take the realities of two-spirit youth into account. For example, limiting discussion of STD prevention to the availability of birth control pills, condoms, or the morning after pills. So assuming most of the time that it's heterosexual sex that people are having. The health of street-involved two-spirit youth would be significantly impacted by the creation of programs that assume a diversity of gender and sexual identities and account for individual and collective experiences of trauma, including trauma related to homophobia and transphobia. So as we look at the themes in the research about two-spirit health, it's worth noting that much of the research seems to define two-spirit people solely through their risk or vulnerability. And this is a common portrayal of Indigenous people in general, especially Indigenous youth. This portrayal is heightened for Two-Spirit people because of the erasure from broader discussions about health. So we come to be defined only through risk instead of being seen and, and then remain invisible in other areas of the field. So although the research identifies important risk factors for Two-Spirit health and seeks to address some key areas where Two-Spirit health is particularly compromised, Two-spirit people have resisted being defined by their pathologization. And that's why I was sure to include examples of two-spirit leadership in some of those areas. Young people, including two-spirit youth leaders, are doing some incredible work to speak back to these narratives defining two-spirit people solely by their risk. And in the report, I have a section about resilience and resurgence of two-spirit roles. And I'm not going to go too much into that because that's, that's available. I wanted today to focus instead or specifically on two-spirit youth leadership and resisting at-risk paradigms. On the screen, I have a quote from a news report that I saw saying that if there's a single indicator of how a child will develop in British Columbia that will define whether or not the child ends up be belonging to the haves or have-nots, it's the possession of an Indian status card. That really defines people like myself any Indigenous person, or here it says status Indian person, that were, you know, destined to belong in, as they say, the have-nots. So really that, you know, equating Indigeneity with pathology and marginalization. And this is especially true for, for Two-Spirit people. So I was really lucky to be part of a national research project with Canadian Aboriginal AIDS Network and their Youth Council, the National Indigenous Youth Council on Sexual Health and HIV AIDS, along with my colleague Natalie Clark. And there's a handout in the side bar there that is beyond at risk info sheet for service providers if you're interested in looking at it. And these five points come from that handout. So the project was really envisioned by Indigenous youth, which includes a diversity of youth who identify variously in terms of their gender and sexual identity. And they were really concerned about the ways that programs for Indigenous youth were about at-risk youth and seeing this term at-risk over and over again. They were interested in talking to their peers about how they, you know, how they heard that term, if that resonated with them, if there were other ways that they wanted to be talked about. And so the youth, five youth in five different communities across Canada interviewed their peers, interviewed other Indigenous youth, and came up with, they also were involved in arts-based analysis and came up with this handout, which is what they want service providers to hear about speaking back to this term at risk. So the five points, I think, really succinctly say what, you know, the messaging that they want people to hear. First, that Indigenous youth are not inherently at risk, that risk is created by colonization. This is something that I've also been trying to emphasize today. 
that the label at risk naturalizes the idea that Indigenous youth live inherently risky lives instead of situating the source of risk in power systems that devalue Indigenous lives that have created trauma, that foster displacement, and for two-spirit people that devalue them, that um, have erased them. So that, that's where the risk comes from, not from within the young people themselves. Secondly, that risk connotes weakness, not strength. And so they like to find ways to talk about the strengths that young people hold. So they're encouraging people to get creative in the words used to talk about Indigenous youth, thinking about especially how young people, and here we might say how two-spirit youth, are talking about themselves. What language did they, are they using? We will go think back to the diversity of words there, they, there is to talk about gender and sexuality. What words are they using? What pronouns are they using? And how can we support that? How can we celebrate and nurture them wherever they are at? Third, beyond simplistic stereotypes lie the strengths and complex knowledges of Indigenous youth. So to look past singular narratives um, rooted in harm, to look for the strengths and the fullness, especially Two-Spirit youth stories and their experiences. Fourth, that youth are situated in networks of relationship and that these relationships provide strength, skills, knowledge, and sustenance. And fifth, that youth are the experts of their own lives, that they are hold immense knowledge, and that their voices deserve to be heard. And this, I think, again, emphasizing the role of two-spirit leadership in a diversity of areas is really to say that there is already a strong leadership amongst two-spirit people within all different areas of society. And so the more we listen to two-spirit people's voices speaking for themselves, the more we can get beyond these singular narratives of risk. So then I just want to, you know, think about then what the Indigenous youth are asking us to do really is to unlearn the messages colonization has taught us about them, about ourselves, and to decolonize our minds and our practice. And when it comes to two-spirit people, this means looking beyond indicators of harm and risk in order to more fully understand two-spirit health in the diversity of lived experiences. Understanding the role of colonization in dismantling Indigenous understandings of gender and sexuality and the systemic discrimination related to colonization, including the erasure of two-spirit people from our communities on a number of fronts, I want us to consider what changes we can each make in our own everyday practices. So, you know, from policy and systemic issues to, to bring it down to the everyday and to our own, our own families, our own communities, the spaces in which we might interact with two-spirit people. So what can we do? to create more welcoming communities to two-spirit people? And how can we contribute to combating or disrupting heteronormativity that we named earlier in order to more fully account for the diverse array of sexual and gender identities of our relatives, our peers, and our clients? And so these are some suggestions that I have. There's lots of others that I encourage you to brainstorm, that not making assumptions about people based on what you see on the outside, that you know then how people identify around gender or sexuality or both. Meeting people where they're at, I think especially allowing people to choose the words they want to use around pronouns or, or names that they've chosen to support that, to meet them where they're at, knowing that that might change. To ask questions if you're not sure. I think especially with pronouns, people tend to, if they mess up, they get ashamed and instead to, to just, you know, normalize it and to to use the pronouns that people use. So if someone is, say, using the term they, and you're just getting used to it, to be honest about that and to, to continue to try anyways. Um, I think that's important. Asking questions as appropriate, I think, is, is another point. Also, importantly, to educate yourself, to, to read, to if there's things that people are talking about to, um, in terms of their own two-spirit identity, to try to look at how you can draw on local resources or other educational resources. Importantly, to learn about the local, culturally specific context that you're living in and working in, because each Indigenous community is different, each local context has a different set of resources, different traditions, different cultural teachings, and is at a different place in the revitalization of Two-Spirit roles and identities. And then to talk to Two-Spirit people, youth and elders in your community, to make those connections and build relationships. And that's, I think, a really key and important point, is to start local and to start in your own in your own backyard. There's a handout in the sidebar there. I think it says reflection questions. And I have a couple of just suggestions for, you know, things to continue thinking about beyond the webinar today.
So changing our practice, you know, rests on knowing ourselves first. And I started today by telling you about my own sort of coming in story. I do this to locate myself within a particular two-spirit experience. And I don't want to speak to anyone else's experience. So I also have to keep listening and learning about the diversity of two-spirit perspectives, those of trans people, people from diverse cultural backgrounds, and just the range of two-spirit experience. So I encourage you to think about these questions after the webinar is done, to reflect on how your story, your teachings and experiences impact the way you hear two-spirit people, the way you engage with two-spirit people, and can integrate a more fulsome account of Indigenous gender and sexuality. So these are just asking you about your own assumptions and how they might shape your practice, about your own thinking about gender and sexuality, really getting you to reflect on where you're starting at. And then these are questions that are also just a starting point. There's many more to ask to think about your community, to assess how welcoming your community or your organization might be for two-spirit people. This, you might, these questions you might talk with with your colleagues, with, your, with family, with other people. The first questions are especially considering how gendered spaces in the community, like washrooms, girls' groups, ceremonial spaces that, have, that are separated often among the gender binary, how can you take non-binary or trans Indigenous people, two-spirit people, into account? So, for example, I used to run girls groups, and if a young girl who was taking part at some point became two-spirit identified, how is that taken into account? How can they not just be thrown out of the group? What kind of, you know, how are you thinking about gender in those spaces so that they don't face that kind of further stigma as they think about their identity? And same goes for for public spaces like washrooms, change rooms, and that kind of thing. And then thinking also about the role of two-spirit people in shaping policy and in leadership in your organizations and what you might do to make those spaces more welcoming and make it more possible for two-spirit people to take up a role. So beyond paradigms of risk and pathology, then, it's important to develop a strength-based approach, again, which is emphasized in the report, and I want to, I think, wrap up soon because we're, we're nearing the end, and I want to ensure there's time for questions. But really want to emphasize that normalizing the words used to talk about two-spirit people, our bodies, our relationships, our gender identities, and sexualities is foundational to challenging the colonial beliefs that have rendered two-spirit people really out of sight, out of mind in a lot of contexts. For two-spirit people claiming traditional cultural roles and responsibilities, has the power to instill positive identities and self-acceptance. Loving yourself is vital to the development of self-esteem, and as a result, good overall health among two-spirit people. So many two-spirit people gain strength from embracing who we are within the context of supportive community. And that might be a two-spirit community, it might be our, our family or cultural community. And I really love this poster. This is a, from the Native Youth Sexual Health Network. I've, I've included it with their permission, and they're available online. You can actually print them out and put them up around your office or, you know, so that two-spirit people see themselves being reflected in your community. And this was a poster campaign done by two-spirit people for two-spirit people. This quote by Leanne Simpson, I think, is really, Anishinaabeg scholar Leanne Simpson is really poignant as well. And she says that we weren't queer before colonization. We were just normal. Many of our societies normalize gender variance, variance in sexual orientation, and all different kinds of relationships, as long as they were consistent with our basic values of consent, transparency, respect, and reciprocity. So she's really kind of rethinking two-spirit people as queer, and instead just thinking about reclaiming and celebrating gender and sexual diversity as being integral to Indigenous communities. So beyond removing stigma, two-spirit health, I think, is reliant on reclaiming and celebrating Indigenous sexuality, our bodies and our lives, which have been greatly, you know, damaged by colonization, by the teachings, especially within residential schools. And one of the most powerful ways to begin to embrace the diversity of two-spirit people is to, I think, again, listen to our stories. Um, There's a great body of literature, artwork, film, and video, and community events produced by two-spirit people and in which two-spirit people are involved. And again, in the report, I give just some of my favorite um, uh, two-spirit writers and performers and artists. And I really love this this quote from Cherokee scholar Daniel Heath Justice, who's a writer. He's a professor here at UBC. It talks about celebrating 
indigenous bodies as not just a part, part place of shame, but as being, you know, a place of pleasure and also as being kind of a productive place, a place to take pride in. He says we need to see the body and in particular for him, the male body as being a giver of pleasure, not just a recipient of somebody else's acts, but a source of pleasure for the self and others. So really thinking about pushing through the stigma around sexuality that we've been taught. At the heart of all of this uh, reclamation is this idea of restoring body sovereignty. And this is, you know, we think about Indigenous sovereignty in communal terms as being about the ability of Indigenous nations to have their authority recognized, to be considered distinct political orders and make decisions about whatever might impact them, such as land use, resource extraction, and so on. But sovereignty is also expressed at the individual level. And this is a term around body sovereignty is being used by people doing work on especially uh, sexual and reproductive health. So to me, body sovereignty, and again, I think this has many diverse meanings, but in relation to this issue, it means being able to be called by a name that you might choose, by the pronoun that you might choose, to choose the words used to talk about your sexual and gender identity, and also being able to make informed decisions about medical procedures. And this includes a lot of you know, health procedures are really gendered and can be very difficult for two-spirit people. So this includes reproductive health procedures like pap tests or breast exams, for example. So supporting the body sovereignty of two-spirit people involves looking at how we can all affirm, uphold, and respect the choices two-spirit people make about our bodies and identities, about our relationships. We can look at the terms that they use that two-spirit people use, respect their decisions, celebrate and normalize their relationships, and look at how our own biases might get in the way of doing so. This can be done in interpersonal kind of interactions, but also can be addressed in policy, in intake forms, for example, which tend to have only two gender options, and in many other ways. And so I want to end with just a few recommended readings. Again, the report has a list of bibliography, a list of authors. I included a few that aren't there. Um, one is this book, new book, A Two-Spirit Journey, The Autobiography of a Lesbian Ojibwe Cree Elder, which is a really beautiful story of Mani Chakabi. I think that's how it's pronounced. That's a book that's come out recently. I also have, if you're interested in thinking about this in relation to anti-violence work, a chapter in the Determinants of Indigenous People of Health in Canada book that is available. There's also a really great online resource for Two-Spirit, a Two-Spirit resource directory that's available online. I've listed here. And there's a really beautiful recent video that's put out by Love Intersections, which does a diversity of videos about relationships. There's a video called Regalia, Pride in Two-Spirits. And this features Dwayne Stewart, who's Heisla and Channel, uh, who I actually had the pleasure of meeting a few months ago, who's just a lovely Two-Spirit leader. And talks really, uh, it's just a very short video, but Duane talks about the importance of recovering cultural teachings that were lost through residential school. And really the, the way that Duane sees taking up the, you know, the role of, um, or being a role model for the next generation of, of two-spirit people. So Gila Kasla, thank you for following along, for joining. And now we'll have some questions and discussion.